Hello and welcome to the Targeted Translation Research Accelerator webinar series focused on ethics and reciprocity in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research. We are glad you could join us today. My name is Mena Lau, the Acting Senior Director of the TTRA program at MTP Connect, and I will be your facilitator this morning, or this afternoon, I should say. So I would first like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the many lands we are meeting on today. I'm personally on the land of the Darug and Kuringai people in New South Wales and pay my respects to their elders past and present. And I also extend that respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us today for this webinar. So now before we launch into the session, I would like to first run through a few pieces of housekeeping. Today's session will include presentation from our speakers followed by an audience Q&A. Uh, to submit your questions, please use the Q&A box rather than the chat box, which should be available at the bottom of your screen in your Zoom toolbar. Questions can be submitted uh, anonymously, but if there is need for any follow-up, we won't able to contact you. However, the team can be contacted via our TTRA email address, which is displayed in the top right-hand corner of this slide. And if you have the same question as someone else, you can upvote, which will raise the question to the top of the list. For those who wish to review this presentation at a later date, or if you have colleagues who couldn't attend, there will be a recording made available as an on-demand video on the MTP Connect website. We'll also be turning this session into a podcast and we will notify all the registrants when it is published. So now um, onto our excellent speakers for the day. Uh, both have extensive experience in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research ethics. First, we have Dr. Summer May Finlay. Uh, Dr. Finlay is a Yoda Yoda woman who grew up on the Awabako and were in my country and is passionate advocate for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. She has worked for a range of organizations in the Aboriginal community control health, not-for-profit, university and for-profit sectors. She is currently a senior lecturer at the University of Wollongong and also the co-chair of the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council of the New South Wales Ethics Committee. We also have Professor Jenny Judd, who has lived and worked in the public sector in the education and health in the Northern Territory in Queensland for the past 30 years. Professor Judd is a professorial research fellow with the Graduate Research School and First Nations Academy in Supervision at Central Queensland University. She is the Chief Investigator of an NHMRC Commissioning Evaluation in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health and Wellbeing Program. Her interest in ethics with Indigenous projects and in particular reciprocity has been ongoing with specific emphasis on self-determination and the importance of working with First Nations peoples in this process. So before I hand over to Summer and Jenny, um, I will first provide an overview about MTP Connect and TTRA for audience members who are not familiar with us. MTP Connect, we are a not-for-profit industry growth centre that was set up in 2015 to support the growth of the medical technology, biotechnology and the pharmaceutical sectors. We're here to champion the sector by working with all the stakeholders across the MTP value chain in meaningful ways to advocate as a trusted independent advisor, to promote greater collaboration nationally as well as internationally and to drive innovation and productivity. MTP Connect also delivers funding for strategic initiatives. Currently, we're deploying more than $182 million of funding on behalf of the Department of Industry, Science and Resources and the Department of Health with its MRFF initiative, and the TTRA is one of them. So the TTRA, which stands for the Targeted Translation Research Accelerator, uh, is a $47 million program specifically designed to provide a new integrated research program to improve the prevention, management and treatment of diabetes and cardiovascular disease and their associated complications in Australia. The TTRA funding is drawn from the Public and Preventative Health Research Initiative of the MRFF, so there is a focus and balance on public health, health equity approaches as well as commercial objectives. So the TTRA is deployed across two key pillars. The first was to establish through a competitive process two national research centres, one for diabetes and another one for cardiovascular disease. 
the Australian Centre for Accelerating Diabetes Innovation, or ACARDI, and the Australian Stroke and Heart Research Accelerator, ASHRA, were both announced as the funding recipients in January 2022 by the Minister for Health and Aged Care. So they will be funded for four years through the TTRA with the $10 million each, and there's expectation they will be sustainable thereafter. In addition to the delivery of research portfolios and training programs, both research centres have placed a focus on funding solutions to reduce health inequities, as well as to support health workforce development for the Indigenous communities. On top of the research centres, the TTRA also provides contestable funding opportunities to support individual diabetes and cardiovascular disease research projects. And to date, $11.9 million have been awarded to 16 research projects through two rounds, and they're attracting an additional $17.7 million in contribution from academia as well as industry. And these projects are addressing the priority areas called for in diabetes and CVD and their associated complications and progressing digital health, medical devices, therapeutics, or standalone behavioral interventions. The TTRA program aims to maximize its investment by funding targeted needs. And for that reason, the priority areas that inform all the funding calls were identified through an evidence-based coordinated health sector needs assessment, including this third and the final round of TTRA research project. And where, which where we'll be focusing specifically on supporting diabetes and cardiovascular disease projects that address the indigenous specific priority areas, and the MTP Canada has also partnered with leading organizations to provide mentoring and commercializations as well as implementation advice to, to support those applying and receiving the funding. In particular, to support round three, we are proud to be partnering with Lucha Institute as a new member of the TTRA partners. So move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, I will remind um, all the potential applicants that the round three research projects are open now and well closed on the 28th of April at 4 p.m. AEST. And it's important to submit the notice of intent first to gain the access of the application. Uh, we cannot accept late submissions, so please be mindful of the time zones and don't leave entering your application into the Smarty Grants platform until the last minute. So now we will um, drop a link of the round three webpage into the chat for your ease of access, but you can also access more information through the QR code by scanning um, it on, from the screen, which also includes the link to the notice of intent form. Uh, if I can please have the next slide, thank you. Um, so to coincide with round three, the TTI research project funding opportunities, MTP Connect is hosting a series of webinars to highlight key elements of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research. And this series is intended for anyone with a broad interest in Indigenous health research, but may also provide potential applicants with key considerations when building their projects and teams. The first webinar in the series was held in November 2022, focused on um, principles of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research and engaging meaningfully with community. And you can access this recording of the webinar, as well as the podcast on the web, um, MTP Connect website. And following today's webinar on ethics and reciprocity, we will have two more webinars in March, one on implementation science and another one on Indigenous data sovereignty. And we'll open those registrations soon, so please watch this space. All right, so now just looking at, we have close to 100 people online today, which is an amazing turnout. So just to find out a little bit more about who is joining us today, uh, we will run three quick polls. Uh, if Adab, I can have those polls running, that would be brilliant. Um, so the first question, uh, we we'll want to learn is your profession, whether you're an academic researcher, an advocate or a consumer representative, health research administrator, health professional, policy maker, or other. Um, if you belong to the other category, please feel free to drop your, you know, your specific profession in the chat box for everyone to know. The second question we want to understand is whether you have involved being involved in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research related to diabetes and or cardiovascular disease? It could be yes, um, 
it could be yes, but not really directly related to diabetes and CVT, or you have not have, um, uh, been involved in the space before. And the third question, um, which is directly related to today's topic of the webinar is, have you ever applied for ethics for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research? Um, it will be an answer either yes or no. So I'll probably skip five more seconds um, to, for you to complete and we'll have the poll result available for everyone to have a look. Deb, how, how is the, um, the response are coming through? Oh, perfect, thank you. All right, so today um, our audience, we have over 50%, uh, so 50% are academic researchers, uh, followed by close health professional, about 21%. Uh, we have some health service administrator online today as well, um, and a couple of advocates, um, a consumer representative, as well as policymaker. And we have 19% of other, um, which we weren't able to capture specifically, um, but it's great to see there's quite a diverse range of um, attendees today. All right, the second question related to uh, whether you've been involved in, in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research in diabetes or CVD, what we can see is the majority, actually 47% said they haven't worked in this uh, space uh, so far. Uh, we have 29% uh, already worked in this um, diabetes and CVD research relating to um, Indigenous health, uh, and also 23% that is working in um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, but not specifically in this indication. And finally, in terms of ethics, so majority 68% of our audience members today um, haven't had the experience in applying for ethics uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health, uh, which is a great reason that you're joining us today. Uh, and we also have 32% who have experience in the past. And that's the, I think those are really uh, interesting numbers for um, our speakers to know. And I think that's a really good time point for me now to welcome um, Summer. Um, and Jenny to, you know, take us through ethics and reciprocity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam, for that fantastic introduction. And it was um, fantastic again to hear about the program. Um, I encourage everybody to be making sure that they are applying. Um, so let me, just, oh, there we go. I'm hoping you can see our screen, fantastic. So before we start, I'm just going to kick over to Jenny to do an acknowledgement of country. Um, um, good morning, everyone. Um, in the spirit of reconciliation, um, we respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands, seas and waterways on which we live, work and play. I pay my respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and their elders past, present and emerging and any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples attending today, all for their long and continuing relationship with the land. Thank you, Summer. Thanks, Jenny. Now, I know that um, there's people on here that have applied for ethics before, and uh, we're skipping, by the way, um, the introduction because Mana did such a great introduction for us. So I just want to actually remind people and I'm bringing up a whole bunch of photos and every single person in here is Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. So before I start any presentation, I just like to remind people that um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are varied and diverse, that we are a heterogeneous group. And it's really important that when you're working with us in any research capacity, that uh, you understand this as well. Um, Particularly when you're actually applying for ethics, you need to be demonstrating that you understand the diversity, whether it is gender, age, geog geography. So I'm a, an urban Aboriginal woman. Um, when I go to say Nullumboy up in the Northern Territory, while I may there may be some similarities, there are certainly a lot of differences. So even as an Aboriginal woman, I need to, to listen and, and talk to the community about what works well for them. So I just wanted to put that up there as a gentle reminder about the diversity because it often gets forgotten. 
So what are we talking about today, Jenny? Well, my goodness, we have quite a few things on our agenda for you. Um, first being looking at ethical conduct in research with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and looking at the Keeping Research on Track document, two that is. Um, we want to think about and talk about how you apply for guidelines, um, the guidelines including Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander governance, reciprocity, community benefit and providing feedback to Aboriginal people, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, which is probably one of the most important elements because in the past, as most of you will know, uh, research has not been kind to Abor Aboriginal people. In fact, they've probably been the most researched group uh, in Australia um, and yet the research has not been shared with people. It's been done. People have done it and left. They've gained their qualifications. They've done what they needed, but the community with whom they were working with actually got very little from that research. So we're here to challenge you to make your research better and different. So just kicking off, um, all of you should know the national statement. I'm not going to labour the national statement other than to say um, 4.7 in the national statement specifically refers to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And then it also refers to the ethical conduct in research with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities, guidelines for researchers and stakeholders. So this was um, developed uh, particularly the ethical guidelines for researchers and stakeholders relating to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people was developed in 2018 and it's the third iteration. I was really lucky enough to be involved in the working group that redeveloped this. And so if you haven't actually worked in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander space, or even if you have, um, I would encourage you to actually go back to the ethical guidelines. Um, even though I was involved in the writing of it, I, I still actually refer to it because uh, I don't have a photographic memory, so I, I still need to make sure that I'm across the details of these guidelines. Now, the national statement obviously is really important, but it would be an unwieldy document if it contained all of the information that's contained in, in these guidelines, the ethical guidelines um, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and other people, which is why, despite the fact that they're guidelines, they're still hugely important for you to actually consider talking about and applying. So we're going to go through these because these will actually be the basis of the information that's required when you're looking at working and researching um, a topic that involves Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And can I say, these actually apply whether or not you're doing an Aboriginal, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander specific study or whether or not you're actually doing a whole of population study with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people involved. The other thing that we want to mention is the Keeping Research on Track, Jenny. Yeah, this is actually one of my favourite documents. And the reason I love it so much is because it actually spells out in very clear language all of the things that you need to be certain that you're putting into your research. Um, for example, things like um, making decisions that ensure the research journey respects Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and communities shared values, diversity, priorities, needs and aspirations. Um, if you work your way through this booklet, it's got lots of really excellent examples that assist you in making sense of those things and how you might then translate those into whatever research you're doing. It also helps make decisions that ensure the research journey benefits Aboriginal people. I mean, in the past, many people have gone in with their own agendas and made their own uh, processes, um, you know, for their good. And they haven't thought about what benefit Aboriginal people um, get out of this particular research. Because really, in the end, you're using their time, you're using their community or their organisation. You're spending a whole lot of time and putting additional uh, sort of um, demands on um, people that are very busy to actually get somewhere for your need rather than their need. So it's really important that we recognise and understand the rights and responsibilities of being involved in all aspects of research and that Aboriginal people who are involved in your research really understand that as well. Um, it's also important that we better understand the steps involved in making e research ethical. Um, 
for example, you know, all of your research makes some demand, make sure that you're being respectful and you're using, um, building good relationships with the people that you're working with. Um, the information comes in this particular document comes from the two very important national publications, the National Statement, which um, Summers just talked to you about, and also the National Statement uh, Ethical Conduct in Research with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Peoples and Communities Guidelines for Researchers and Stakeholders. That's the AATC ones, um, and they're called the guidelines. Importantly, it covers the values and principles and how these can be put into practice and uh, both for researchers, for participants and for communities. <clears throat> Thanks, Jen. Um, so in the NH and MRC ethical guidelines for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, as well as the Keeping Research on Track, which is the community version of that, there are a number of values. Um, responsibility, reciprocity, respect, equity, cultural continuity, spirit and integrity. So for those of you that have been in the space for a long time, and I know that I saw some of you that I recognise um, listed on the screen have been involved for a long time, you'll notice that cultural continuity is different from what it was previously, which was um, survival and protection. So we're just going to briefly go through each of these values. One thing I'm going to say about these values is there's not a hierarchy, which is why the image is, just, is in a circle. So they're all as equally important and you need to build them all into your um, research. And so you actually should be building these into your research, which then gets communicated through your ethics application. Um, a lot of people seem to do it retrospectively. They try and retrofit these values into their research when they start to apply for ethics because they realise oh crap, I haven't actually done some of these things. So we highly encourage you to think about these from the beginning of your um, research development. Spirit and integrity is the one that seems to catch people up the most. Um, and one of the things when we did the review, when the review was done of the former guidelines, the NH and MRC guidelines for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research, was people didn't understand this one. So essentially this is at the core of all of the other values and if you're demonstrating the other values then you're demonstrating spirit and integrity so again it goes toward it, it, you need to be demonstrating that you're doing this to the benefit of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as defined by them so this is about all of the other values as defined by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and that's another thing that I want to say is if you're not Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, the way you apply or understand these values might be different because you're bringing your own cultural lens to it. So you actually need to be making sure that you're understanding these values from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander point of view. And the only way you can do that is by making sure that you engage Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in your research, um, as well as actually listening to them because you can engage them and just ignore them which is you know it happens regularly enough um, unfortunately so that's something I really want to encourage you to understand is that you need to make sure these are built in from the get-go they're all equally important and that if you're and that if you're building in all of the values then you're demonstrating spirit and integrity. Jen? Yeah sorry cultural continuity is also another really important um, value. Uh, it's about preserving cultural con continuity in research. So to do that, it's really important to respect bonds and relationships between people and their environment and design research to respect and preserve these. The last thing you want to do is to go into a community or an organisation and start destroying things because you don't really understand how important it is to respect what's already there and the relationships that people have between themselves and their environment. Um, you need to understand, um, sorry, I've, I've just buggered this up. Um, understand that research has often been an exploitive exercise. So people don't really, Aboriginal people often don't like research because in the past it's been fairly, um, difficult for them because it hasn't actually benefited them in any way and it's been disrespectful in terms of their culture and um, their relationships. Um, 
We need to establish mechanisms that incorporate the balance between the collective and the individual identity. For those people who understand collectivist societies, it's the collective that's more important than the individual. In Western societies, it's the individual that counts most. So you need to be considering how you think about the collective and how you treat the collective as an important element and that the individual will always make the best decisions in terms of the collective, not in terms of themselves. So um, you need to make sure that you're um, inclusive of advisory groups from inception to conclusion. One of the most important things about Indigenous or um, First Nations research is that it should be led by First Nations peoples. So if you're not a First Nations people person, <laughs> sorry, you need to engage with First Nations peoples to be able to have an advisory group, a steering group, a group that actually leads the research and you help facilitate that process. So that's an important um, thing that everybody needs to consider. You need to engage with both people and their community, sometimes collectively and sometimes as individuals. You need to find ways of working that recognize and promote cultural distinctiveness. Um, that means not. Uh, that means respectfully working with people, listening deeply to people when they tell you things, and not disregarding their points of view. Because the whole purpose is to benefit those people as much as it benefits your needs. And you need to dis demonstrate and respect values-based expectations and identity. You need to think about using Aboriginal standpoints, voices and methodologies when developing research protocols. And you can only do that if you work with people, not on people. Um, so you have to involve people in those processes from the beginning to the end. And also it's essential to understand the role of Indigenous knowledges. And from a white fella perspective, that's me, uh, what you can do and what you, what you can and what you can't know. Because we're curious, we often delve deep into things that are really not our business. And Aboriginal people have a particular way of working with their own knowledges. Certain people have um, that knowledge, other people can't have that knowledge for cultural reasons. And we go thumping in and wanna know everything. I think we just need to sometimes stop and think if people don't tell you about it, it's not your information. So that's one thing I would really stress. Thanks, Jen. And can I just add that, um, and just on the flip side, sometimes people will share stuff with you, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it needs to make it into the research. So if you're a man and, and they share men's business with you, and then you go and publish that, like I've seen in articles before, because I'm a, an editor on the Australian New Zealand Journal of Public Health, um, you can't publish that information because all sorts of people are going to be reading it. So just thinking about uh, and making sure you're checking back with people to make sure that you're honouring what they've told you and also what they've shared with you and whether or not you're allowed to share it. So cultural continuity is actually a really big thing. Um, look, the next one I think is really simple, equity. We get that. It's not equality, it's equity. Um, the thing that I would say about this is that there are, uh, going back to that slide where I showed the diversity of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, um, those like myself tend to be able to uh, engage within the research space much better, even since before I got my PhD, largely because of my level of education. So you need to be thinking about making sure you include a wide range of people in your research, not just the people such as myself, because while I am a community member, I'm a mum, I'm an auntie, I'm a daughter. Um, not everyone has saved my experiences, but also remembering that, you know, we, we need to make sure that there were inclusive of young people as well. So uh, about two thirds of our populations are under the age of 30. And then obviously thinking about people with a disability and LGBTQI community. We certainly have um, a diverse range of people within our communities and they often don't get represented. So it's really important Then we're thinking about this, we're thinking about the, the, the multiple types of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that need to be involved in your research. Sorry. Um, so it's also, this is probably one of the very cool um, or well, most important parts, reciprocity. 
Um, we need to think, understand that reciprocity may be demonstrated in a wide range of ways. So ways to identify priorities and needs from the community, organisations and individuals. We need to think about researchers holding workshops to deliver the results of research to communities and that's dissemination back to communities. And the reason for that is that people can actually use the information you collect to make changes in their own community to improve their ways of well-being and um, things like that. So it's important, imperative, in fact, that it needs to be fed back. You need to ensure that peoples and communities get their information back so they can use it. Um, you need to offer offers of training and skills development and education. This is in the capability development component because capability is a really important component of anything we do. So when you're working with community and you've offered to do some workshops around specific needs of the community, that's capability development. And it should be an imperative in every piece of research that we do, really. Um, and we need to identify, also think about unintended consequences. What happens? And so you need to be talking with Aboriginal people all the way through your research and getting feedback about what you're doing and making sure that you're not doing any harm. Um, and there's also the importance of transparent research that extends to individuals and communities and land. You need to identify unintended consequences. Um, you need to think about the sustainability of the benefit. So you might say that it's gonna be beneficial for people but is it a short-term thing or is it going to be something that you can sustain by the ways in which you feed it back and by the ways in which the community then is able to use it to sustain that benefit? Um, there's also social, social and cu cultural accountability between individuals and communities that you need to consider. You need to seek ongoing advice, be flexible and manage risks. You need to give timely feedback and transparent dissemination and you need to monitor your ethical practice because the most important thing is that you don't want to do any more harm than has already been done. Can I just say a lot of people actually see reciprocity as giving gift vouchers. Now, there's nothing wrong with giving gift vouchers to recognise people's time. I think that is something that should be done. But reciprocity, when you build relationships with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and communities, is much more than a gift voucher. So um, thinking about actually asking people in the long term what it might be and relationships, which is, is one of the... Um, one of the, the key components of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research should be built up over time and if you're talking to people the reciprocity might be not directly related to the research that you're doing so if you've got a relationship and you've gone in and you've done a number of research projects and they turn around and say look we'd like some help evaluating a particular program figure out how you can do that make sure that you're actually supporting the community and what the community needs the other thing is, as I said, it doesn't have to be directly related. So I have a skill set that's communication. So with my PhD, I talk to communities about running workshops on um, KPIs, which is what my PhD was on, but also on how to use social media um, for advocacy. But also I, I offered to write a good news article for Crokey Health Media, which is um, I'm a member of Crokey Health Media and, and, a, and a contributing editor for them. So I think you need to be creative and otherwise if you're not actually doing reciprocity and all you're doing is giving a gift voucher, I would label your research as extractive. Respect. Look, I think respect is kind of covered in some of the stuff that we've been talking about to date. It is respecting for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander culture and beliefs. So that's when you're engaging with communities. And can I just say, when we talk about communities, we're not necessarily always talking about a discrete Aboriginal community. So it could be a discrete community. My grandma grew up on Kamragunja, which is the mission down um, on the Murray River near Echuca and Shepparton. Um, so that, that, that's a discrete community and that, that mission is still there and people still live on it. But we also were talking about people, whether you're doing a, a study on genomics and you're looking at a particularly rare disease, so the community could be the people with the rare disease. So community is, is varied. So we don't talk about necessarily um, 
a discrete community and understanding that is part of respect. And again, understanding both the individual and the collective responsibilities. So I'm involved with the Commonwealth Government. I facilitate their Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Genomics Working Group, which are looking to develop, well, we've developed and we're refining the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Guiding Principles for Genomics. And thinking about balancing the, um, balancing out the collective need versus the individual need is, is, is quite a challenge, but really important. So respecting that, Sometimes the individual, as Jenny has said, their particular needs may come after the collective um, or they may not, depending on what that community wants to do in that instance. And thinking about making sure that um, it's about relationships. So we often, and I'm going to use co-design as an example, um, we often hear the word co-design being bantered about and what it actually means in practice is that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander get people get to tinker around the edges of whatever it is the researchers have actually decided they're already going to do. That's not genuine co-design, which means it's not genuine respect. So if you genuinely want to respect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, you need to make sure that we're engaged in all stages of the project. Now, Jenny and I are going to have to hurry up a little bit because we have a lot more we need to get through. Um, yeah. Oh, God, is it me next? Yep. Yes, it is. <laughs> okay, so recognition of core Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander responsibilities to country and kinship bonds and maintain harmony and balance is important. Negotiating research processes, purposes and methodology in ways that ensure the research is wanted by the community Think about facilitating educational sessions and workshopping best ways to work with organisations, individuals and communities to fulfil their goals at the workshop of the workshop. It's about providing all information for participants, outlining authorship um, opportunities, intellectual property arrangements, formalising of research agreements. For example, if you're working with a community and that those, there's some people or individuals in that space that are without them, your papers wouldn't be written and they're giving you intellectual input, they are definitely part of the authors of that paper and should be respected in that regard. So um, do no harm or threaten what individual in Indigenous communities and individuals have. Um, value, that is, sorry. Social and cultural accountability towards individuals and communities. You need to negotiate plan, purpose, methodology and feedback. And you also need to seek ongoing advice, be flexible and manage risk. It's important um, that responsibility is a two-way street. It's not just about responsibility of you, the researcher, it's about the responsibilities of the people involved in the research too. Um, I think yep. that covers off that. Thanks, Jen. Look, we're going to just stop for a little bit and see if there's any questions. Um, don't forget to use the Q&A. And we've got one question in there. Um, in there. And I think... So I'll just... This is a, this is a question by a anonymous person so that you we encourage you to put your questions in there either anonymous or put your name to them that's fine um given the diversity so I'll read the question out given the diversity within First Nations communities what is the best way to understand First Nations perspectives on the ethical values for a study with incidental recruitment of First Nations participants for example should you prioritize partnership with the communities you think will be most included in the research participant population. Look, this is a really good question and something that comes up a lot. So firstly, I'd say that this study, sorry, this funding round is about cardiovascular disease and diabetes. So I would not anticipate that you will have incidental recruitment. So we will be overrepresented as we are in the data. So we're four times more likely to have diabetes and cardiovascular disease is the biggest killer of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So we won't be incidental in this funding round. But and to be quite frank with you, we're usually not very incidental in most studies unless you've got a very small sample size. So I remember there was one sample that I saw of 50 people that was about um, forensic uh, mental health hospitals um, and they were likely to only have two people. 
So that's probably the smallest I've seen. Um, we would always encourage you to think about what's proportionate to your research. So it really depends on your research. So if you're doing a PhD, for example, it tends to be a much smaller study. If you're doing a Centre for Research Excellence, it's a much larger study, and it will be expected that you will have Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander researchers, as well as engaging with communities, um, as well as probably having a reference group. So the answer is there's not a one-size-fits-all. You need to really be thinking about engaging with the communities in your space. If it is a national project, I would be looking at which of these communities actually have a higher proportion of whatever it is that you're studying. Or I would make sure you engage an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander researcher from the get-go to be able to provide you advice specific to the topic area that you're studying. So I can't give you a clear-cut answer on, on this. And as my mum would say, it's like, how long's a piece of string? So it, it varies depending on your on your um, your study, but it is a really good question. And my short the short answer is, we're highly unlikely to be incidental. So therefore, you need to be thinking about us from the get go, and then you also need to be making sure that you engage with the appropriate people or organisations from the get go to providing advice around this particular topic. Um. If there's any other questions, we're going to ask, we've got another spot for questions and then we'll have, of course, questions at the end. So honestly, this is your opportunity to pick our brain. Um, ethics can be tricky and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander ethics can be tricky. So please throw all your questions at us. Uh, there's nothing that we can't handle. <laughs> and it's probably been asked before. So um, there's no shame in asking any of the questions. So what does it mean in practice. Oh, we've got another question coming through. Do you have advice when consulting with First Nations people where many language groups are in the one place? Um, uh, now, that's a really good question, actually, as well. So if you look at the Illawarra, Wollongong, or you look at most places on the East Coast, for example, we are going to have various people from various nations. And we may also have people actually don't know who their mob are, so what nation they're from, because they're stolen generation or for a range of other reasons. Um, it's always good to make sure you consult with a variety of organisations. So, for example, the Aboriginal Land Council or the Aboriginal Medical Service to make sure that you're actually consulting as many and wide ranging people as possible. Um, again, it's proportionate to the size of your study. Again, if you're doing a very, very small pilot study, obviously it's going to be more limited versus a very large national study. So it does need to be proportionate. But again, you need to be really thinking about making sure that you're consulting with a wide range of people. Um, and often the best way is to actually approach organisations. But please don't make a cold call. Build your relationships. Um, if you get a call like four, three days before an ethics application is due, ask to be consulted, you're more likely to not, not actually um, fit into people's diaries. So as Jenny said in one of the other points, you need to be making sure that you're engaged early and that the, um, the research is of benefit. So thank you. Okay, so we're going to be talking to you now about what this means in practice. Um, thank you for your question that you've just put up. We might just uh, answer that at the end, at the next um, questions, because I think that some of what we're going to be talking about will actually uh, answer that question. So when, look, there's lots of things to consider when you're thinking about ethics from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander point of view. So, of course, um, ethics and the national statement in its entirety applies to us, um, talking about consent, et cetera, but there's also some other things to consider specifically. We've kind of touched on them a little bit. So governance, reciprocity, community, feed, uh, community benefit and feedback are some of the, the really important things you need to consider. Jenny, do you wanna talk about governance? Oh yeah, look, this is one of my favorites. Well, it's not, it's because it's almost an essential or crucial aspect of your research. If you are just white fellas going into black fellas spaces, then for goodness sakes, you need to do something about getting Indigenous people at the head of the tail, at the head of the, the game, really. So who's on your team? The questions you need to ask are who's on my team? 
if I haven't got any Aboriginal people involved in my team, what am I thinking about? Why should I be doing this research? I would ask myself, because it's absolutely essential that Indigenous folk are involved in the process from before you start till when you finish and then after. So what Indigenous representation do you have on your team? That's a really important question and it's something you need to be able to answer in terms of ethics because best practice, best evidence practice tells us that Indigenous people be, need to be involved in the whole process. So how you involve those people in a respectful way is a really important element of your governance. Um, how do you support Indigenous leadership? Is there ways in which you can work with people to encourage them to, to be leaders? Um, have you set up a steering group of various peoples involved in the group? And for the person that was asking about language groups, you ensure that you've got a language group representative on your steering group so that their perspectives are actually considered in the process. Um, how do you negotiate with the group? Are you listening carefully to what the group is suggesting? Or are you just railroading people or asking them to agree with you? Um, it's about listening carefully and deeply and it's making sure that you've got the right people on the group and you need to listen to the community or the organisation about that because they will know who the best person is to have there. Um, and how do you remain accountable to the group? So what sort of situation have you set up so that you're feeding back regularly? How do you negotiate the community's needs and your needs and balance this with the aims of the research and do it in an ethical way? These are all difficult questions, but if you're involving people from the beginning in the governance of the process, you should be able to manage that research in a much more respectful and trustworthy way. Um, do you want to add anything, someone? Uh, of course, this is because this is the big tricky thing that we find. So as the co-chair of the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council of New South Wales, um, this is something we often find people don't do very well, particularly people that are new to working in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander space. It is we expect to see Aboriginal governance over all aspects of the project. Um, and what that looks like will vary depending on the project. And if it's an Aboriginal specific project and there's no Aboriginal researchers, we will be questioning that. Um, it's really important. And again, you need to be thinking about what Aboriginal people bring to a research project. They may not have a PhD, but they may know their community very, very well. And if you can't do the research without them, then they should be a chief investigator on the project. Full stop. Um, if you're actually talking about really sensitive stuff uh, and you're collecting information, so an Aboriginal research assistant is really important and thinking about making sure that it's gender, um, might, gender might be really important. Like I've seen research studies that have actually got an Aboriginal man going in to talk to um, Aboriginal women about domestic violence and, and women who are in jail. That is not ethical. Um, steering groups and committees are really important, but they're not the only thing you should be doing as well. And again, when we talk about co-design, we're talking about genuine co-design, not that gammon co-design where you get to tinker around the edges, but starting right from the get-go, which brings me to the next slide, actually, which is when to engage Aboriginal people right from the get-go. If you haven't engaged Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people right from the get-go, we'll actually be able to tell that within your ethics application. And we'll often, I've actually, I've actually declined applications where it's really clear that there's been no Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people involved in the, in the project and there's some serious concerns about the cultural appropriateness of the research. So you need to actually be talking to people right from the beginning. And again, so is this a benefit to Aboriginal people? Do they have the capacity? Um, and then the design. So thinking about what's going to be the most appropriate design. I've also seen other projects where they just get Aboriginal people to go out and collect the data. And that's the only time Aboriginal people are involved. But if Aboriginal people are asking questions that have been designed by non-Aboriginal people, they're probably not going to be the right questions. Um, or the, you know, so it's really important that you make sure they're not, not just involved in the implementation, but all of the stages before it and the analysis interpretation. It's really, really important because particularly it doesn't matter if it's quant or qual data. 
the, you are going to interpret that data in a particular way. And thinking about how that data uh, might be viewed once you write it up is really important. So there was a question about um, about whether or not researchers should take the draft paper to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to ensure the language and context is appropriate. Absolutely. But I would actually be talking to people well before that to make sure that people are actually um, engaged right from the get-go of the write-up about what is really important. And that brings us to Indigenous data sovereignty. I'm not going to labour this because we are running out of time, but um, Indigenous data sovereignty is something that I you need to look at. This looks at Indigenous um, uh, intellectual property. It looks at Aboriginal governance over the data, what data is collected, why it's collected and how it's used. So building Indigenous data sovereignty into any project you use is really, really important. So I'm just going to have a look and see if there's any questions we haven't discussed so far. <clears throat> um, is it appropriate to have documents specifically de developed for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? So there's a lot of, there's a big question here, so I'm going to break it into different parts. Um, if you're doing a study and you're asking questions around, um, say, any, anything actually involving Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, it often is relevant to make sure that you have different interview guides or surveys because the social, historical and political context means that um, what you're asking needs to be different. So it is appropriate. And if it is uh, obviously people who first language isn't English, obviously you need to think about that as well. Um, so consent, again, is something that's really important and making sure that your consent forms are clear and concise and in plain English is really important and giving people the option if English is not their first language to have it translated. For people whose literacy levels might not be very good, um, obviously reading it to them and explaining it if that's what they want is a good option. Um, and so it depends. So having a separation, I mean, to be honest with you, most people aren't familiar with research. So having plain English consent forms should be what we do as standard practice. So as researchers, we forget what's jargon. We forget that most people don't, don't think like we do um, or don't use the language that we use. So I would encourage all of our consent forms to be in plain English, regardless of whether they're for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, we're just going to quickly go over now. This is my, my love and my passion. So I'm going to quickly run through now specific Aboriginal ethics. Um, we're finishing up at quarter past, so I'm going to take another probably five minutes on this section and then we'll be able to open it up for conversation. So for those that don't know, I'm the co-chair of the Aboriginal Health and Medical Research Council of New South Wales Human Research Ethics Committee, and we're one of three specific Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander ethics committees in the country. And what, our, what we cover is the jurisdiction of New South Wales and New South Wales only. We are an NHMRC registered committee. We are, there is also one in South Australia, the Aboriginal Health Research Ethics Committee, South Australia. And then there's the Western Australian Aboriginal Health Ethics Committee in Western Australia. Um, so Menzies also covers the Northern Territory, Menzies School of Health Research, but they're a mainstream committee with an Aboriginal subcommittee. So it's really important that if you're doing any work in New South Wales, South Australia, Western Australia, or Northern Territory that involves Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that you're also submitting a full ethics application to each of these committees. And I say a full ethics application because we don't rubber stamp other people's ethics we actually do a full review because what we're looking at it is from an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander point of view. And given particularly that the three ethics committees that are Aboriginal specific have a large majority of Aboriginal people on it, and this is all we look at, we're looking at it differently than a mainstream committee who may respectfully have one or two Aboriginal people, but don't have as much experience in this space as we do. So you often need to submit when you're got an Aboriginal specific project, I think that's a given, but you also need to submit when you plan on analysing the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander data specifically. 
So if you're collecting the variable and you're planning on analysing, it absolutely needs to come to us because that interpretation is really important. Um, also need to be thinking about, and this goes to the incidental question earlier, if Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people will be overrepresented, i.e. more than 3.2% of the population, then you absolutely need to be going to an AREC, Aboriginal Human Research Ethics Committee. Also, if the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander experience these or condition is different, sorry, left off a word there, is different. So, for example, if um, smoking, for example, the reasons why people smoke might be similar, but there's also significant differences. So you need to be thinking about making sure that you are um, uh, include, uh, coming to us as an HREC. So that's kind of the, the short and long of it. We do actually, so all of the um, AREX and MEMSIs will be able to take your application either after you've submitted to your own institution or simultaneously or even first. Um, each of the AREX actually are independent of each other, so we are, do have slightly different criteria. So I highly encourage you to make sure you engage with each of the individual AREX before early. you... Early. thank you. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Um, it can take some time and I can say that the biggest issue we have with applications is the lack of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander engagement in the design but also in terms of the ongoing governance. Um, if you actually follow the guidelines and, and, and think about all of the things we've spoken about here today, you will actually find that your application will be approved much smoother and you may still get questions because everybody has um, questions on their ethics applications usually, but you will find it's a smoother process. And I will be honest, if you argue with the AREACs, um, with the secretariat or the co-chairs, much like myself, about um, what we're suggesting that you do, um, it's not a great look. This is what we do. This is our experience. We're researchers and we're Aboriginal. And if you're a non-Aboriginal person trying to argue with us on what's appropriate for Aboriginal community, that usually doesn't go down so well. Um, just want to quickly um, sum up what some of the things we've talked about today that are common issues that we have. And I'm just going to touch on them as a high level, Jenny, because we're running out of time. I agree. Is that intellectual property and Indigenous knowledges needs to be built into your research from the get go. Something Jenny um, was really um, strong on was, and I, I have to say I 100% agree, is that um, the deficit approach is not appropriate. You really need to be taking a strengths-based approach. Um, relationships are really important. If you are new to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander space and trying to lead a very large project um, and you don't have any relationships within the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander space, it's probably not advisable that you lead it. It's probably better that you join another project. Um, understand how things work within our communities and think about actually joining at a later date and capability building. I would not be standing here if people like Jenny hadn't actually helped me develop my skills as a researcher over time. I've known Jenny and you can see we've coordinated for today just by accident. <laughs> I've known Jenny now since 2009. We met at the one of the health promotion conferences in Melbourne and since then, I've been very lucky to have Jenny and people like Margaret Cargo and a number of other Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people building my capability. So I'm a, now a senior lecturer, um, as well as leading that NH and MRC grant that Jenny listed in her bio, um, which I'm very, very grateful for. So capability building goes beyond just a little bit of tokenistic training. It goes about investing and developing your relationships. So... I'm getting I, another message. Can I from just Deb. make one yep. quick thing? If the IP and the Indigenous knowledge is stuff, please read Terry Janke's work because there's a heap of really excellent things in that stuff that you will get. Um, some really good things in that regard. Yep. So here's a list. And so these slides, I'm hoping we'll make them available, but otherwise we can get um, the team to send them out. Here's a list of really important uh, references that will help you develop your ethics. Now we're going to take some more questions. Um, I think we've answered some of these so I'm just going to go through. Um, should individual ATCHOs work towards their own ethics committee or is it better to collaborate with universities and other organisations with established ethics committee? So um, this is from an anonymous one and it's kind of slightly outside the scope but I'll try and answer it quickly 
is um, developing and maintaining an ethics committee is very, very time consuming. So the AHMRC ethics committee meets once every six weeks and we get between 20 to 35 applications every six weeks. So I wouldn't expect each ATCHO, Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisation, to have an ethics committee, but I would certainly hope that eventually we are in a situation where each state and territory has an ethics committee um, and also potentially a national one as well. What about Queensland? That's a really good point. Um, it is. <laughs> uh, Jenny's in Queensland and she knows perfectly well that there's no AREC in Queensland, despite the fact Quake has looked at have, getting one for quite some time, but they are quite resourced. They do need resourcing for that. Um, in Queensland, you speak to the local organisation that you're working with and to see whether they have a preference. Some organisations, some ATCHOs um, go to the University of Queensland, some go to JCU. So it really is about working with that community to make sure you identify who they want you to go through with ethics. Um, um, yeah, and often you're not just working in Queensland. So if you're working in another state or territory, you're lucky if you go to New South Wales or whatever to do it that way. But mostly it's through university ethics committees is what you have left. Um, the health department um, has its own ethics process as well. Um, so what if Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are overrepresented but demographic data on Indigenous status isn't collected? Um, I don't see why Indigenous status isn't collected. Um, as I said, we are overrepresented in most things relating to health. Um, our experiences are often very different. Uh, say access, we might find that there's not culturally appropriate access versus, um, you know, physical access. So if you're not collecting it, I would I would ask you why. I, I don't actually, I've never come across a project that shouldn't collect it. Um, um, there was a question about the AATSI versus NH and MRC and the differences. Generally yes. speaking, the principles are the same. Yeah. Um, I did some work around some of this recently and each of those things are based on self-determination, which is a really important principle. And those principles are that even with when you're thinking about the ways in which you deal with data, for self-determination, it means that the Aboriginal people should have a say about what data you're using in your project, because that means they get to say what's useful, what isn't, and you don't have a right to use it if it's not okay with them. Yeah. So the IATSIS, so just um, and just to follow up on that, the IATSIS committee um, is a is not an Aboriginal community controlled committee like the rest of us mm. other than Menzies um, they also while do do some health stuff they're not health specific mm. and don't have the skills and expertise to do say a genomics project data linkage project um, or a highly clinical project that the AREC's have so and they're not in an H and MRC registered committee so it is not a replacement for any of the AREC's if you're going to be working in South Australia Victoria sorry, South Australia, um, New South Wales, WA, or in the Northern Territory. So um, go to them, but you still need to come to us. Oh, we've got, the questions are coming in thick and fast. Um, yes, so you do need to submit to more than one AREC if you have a multi-jurisdictional project. Uh, each of us actually have our individual consideration. Um, so you will need to submit to, there's nothing in Victoria, but if you are working on a national project, you will actually need to submit to the Northern Territory, WA, South Australia and New South Wales. I had seven ethics committees for my PhD, which was a national project. Um, and while it might be time consuming, it's what you got to do. So I, I would just tell you to suck it up and do it. <laughs> um, honestly, it's it, there's no way around it if you're actually going to do good research and culturally appropriate research. Um, Yes, you do need to, so if you've submitted to the Aboriginal ATREC and had the project approved, do you need to resubmit any further approval before you analyse the data? Not before you analyse the data. So if you come to the AHMRC Ethics Committee, um, you don't need to come to us again. Part of your ethics approval will be a condition that you submit any manuscripts or publications um, for review. And normally that's just a matter of process. But in the past, we have found some um, inappropriate and insensitive publications, which is why we've ended up doing that. So 
Um, so if you're doing a pilot study, you still need to get um, a REC approval. It's still a study, um, unless, of course, it's a CQI project and you have no intention of publishing in any way, shape or form. Where can you start? Who can help for application admission? I'm assuming <laughs> ethics. Well, I mean, if you've submitted ethics before, you should be quite familiar with the processes more generally. Um, if you're talking about a REC support, they can support you through the secretariat, but it will be high level support. If you need specific support with the Aboriginal HREC, compo HREC components, you genuinely need to make sure you go to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to be helping you with this. And if you're getting Aboriginal people to help you with this, they should be CIs on the project. Um, um, Aboriginal sovereignty, can I just say the Michael Y study uh, that out of ANU, which is run by um, Professor Ray Lovett, is probably one of the best studies that I've seen. They have a really strong governance and I would and it's it's publicly available on the ANU website. So I would highly encourage you to do that as well. Um, and given that the data storage is never an issue in terms of um, meeting the NH and MRC guidelines. So you can do both, have Indigenous data sovereignty as well as meet the NH and MRC guidelines. I'm an Aboriginal researcher, I've been doing it and there's never been an issue and Jenny's the same as far as I'm aware. So it's, um, yeah. Anyway, we probably need to pull a pin on us talking, Jenny. <laughs> yes. um, do you have anything else you want to add? Uh, no, but there are so many really good resources out there. And in terms of the deficit language stuff, Loacher put out a really good um, thing and I haven't got it with me at the moment. But if you go into the Loacher site, you'll find it. Um, it's called um, Deficit. Um, oh, I forget now. Anyway, um, it's important. Go for strengths. It's always a much nicer approach. We know that things are bad. I'm not disregarding the fact that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health is much worse than general everyday run-of-the-mill Australians' health. Um, I think it's really important that we do things that make a difference. And in doing that, we let, we not let, we make sure that Aboriginal people are leading, leading it. Absolutely. And apologies if that felt really rushed. There is so much to cover. We're both very passionate about this topic um, and we hope we've given you a taster and enough information to start thinking about what it is you need to know. Thanks very much. Oh, hang on. How do we do this? Ah, I'm just Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Summer and Jenny. Now everyone can see your your faces. I forgot to just to mention that you you could <laughs> stop sharing and everyone can can see your full faces. But that, I, I think we ran through all the questions, right? Is there two more that's in the Q and A, Summer or Jenny? Are they all being answered? Yeah, I think we've answered okay. those, I think. Yeah, we've Oh, no, can I just say the first one? How do you go about discussing interview findings with a reference group to come to a consensus on key themes without presenting a huge amount of data and transcripts? So there's a couple of things I want to say um, to this is that firstly, um, if you're engaging Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research and researchers' assistants in the project, they would be the people to help you navigate this. Often you'll do a preliminary um analysis and then you would take that analysis back to the community with key quotes to make sure that you're actually making sense of what's being said appropriately. So the NH and MRC grant that Jenny and I are working on, we're going to be doing case studies and that's the way we'll manage it is that we'll, we've got 50%, more than 50% of the, the team are Aboriginal and, or Indigenous because we've got a, a wonderful Māori person who's joined our team. Um, we'll also be working with any of the local community members that are re as research assistants, and then we'll present the preliminary findings to, to have a, as a sense making. Um, of course, if people want access to the transcripts, they of course need to be on the ethics. So um, you would need to list them on their ethics application as, as part of the reference group if you do want full um, transcripts. And to be honest with you, some mob do. So when in doubt, just ask. I think and that's it. There's some really good papers around um, about how you can manage things like yarning groups with um, and getting that information back to the group and getting the group to actually say these are the bits you can use, these are the bits you can't use. So um, Shay's paper is a really good one on that. Um, 
anyway, there's a bunch of them. Sorry, La. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I think we're tracking really well time. Um, we've got five minutes. Um, but probably just want to mention, yes, yeah, Summer, um, Jenny, um, we will make the slides available to everyone uh, with the recording. Uh, so, you know, you have those reference slides that I think that would be really handy uh, and people would definitely want to get a hand on it. So it would be great. So we will make them available to, um, to have them available on our website. Um, so, because I I think I got informed that the, the chat box wasn't um, enabled at the beginning. Maybe it was just popping the, the Brown 3 research project uh, web pages again. So yeah, oh, perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. Um, but just want to thank you again to Summer and uh, Jenny for, you know, providing those practical tips and adding colours to ethics and reciprocity in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health research. From, you know, I'm definitely learning from your presentation and, you know, it's not easy. Um, you definitely need to build that engagement, like, for example, between yourself and yourself, um, that... Um, that relationship took, you know, a couple of years to develop. Yeah, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess if, is there any like a last, I guess we have a couple of minutes left. Is there any last um, sort of uh, like a tip you have for, for the potential applicants for round three that you probably would like to share with them before we end? Chad, what's your key tip? My key tip is if you haven't got relationships sorted, don't apply yet. Make sure that you work hard on getting those relationships in place and be really sure that you've got really great governance and other things set up because it's much better to wait a year. If it's a year, I don't know. I'm sorry, I don't know the, the process, but it's much better for you to work on, on the stuff for a year and then go for it um, than it is to rush it and not have it in place. I think. I would like to echo that. It's really important to make sure. And again, um, if you're a fly in, fly out researcher, you know, you're not going to get uh, Aboriginal people involved in the long term. Um, you, are, you really are going to find it difficult to get engagement now and also then get ethics. Um, the other thing is that if you're going to, if you don't have a strong track record in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander space. Um, I highly encourage you to partner with people, organisations or communities that are actually doing this work. So make sure that you just don't go it alone because you will find uh, it much more difficult. So um, bring, bring people onto your team that can help facilitate yeah. this. And when I say bring them onto the team, please make sure you're, you're respectful of their contribution and they are CIs. And build a team. Like, the whole idea is if you don't have researchers who can do it, then you make your relationships with that community or organisation and you work with people in it to build their skills because what you want to do is leave afterwards with an extending sustainable benefit for that organisation, that community, that team. So um, that's what I would say. It's worth, it's worth it to put the time in. Um, you'll go much better that way. Perfect. Thank you, Summer Jenny. Um, if I can have the uh, our final slides, just because we're going to have a um, yes. Thank you so much. So um, we're towards the end of of the webinar, uh, but just to remind everyone, this won't be the first, like the last time uh, or the only time you can ask questions relating to round three. Um, the team will be available to answer other questions relating to the round three research project applications so feel free to email them to the TTRA inbox and we're always here to help um, uh, so before you ask uh, when you exit the um, the webinar there will be an anonymous survey for you to um, please complete it will help us to know what really worked well what hasn't and where can we improve for the next time so thank you so much so finally I would really like to thank our presenters um, again Summer and Jenny uh, for your wisdom um, and our also our behind the scenes with we have um, Dee Dee, Erin from the TTRA team as well as Deb and Nat from our communication team who's you know put a lot of effort into having this webinar together so again um, I'd like to 
thank our audience members for joining us. And we hope this uh, webinar provided some practical tips and, and probably potential advice if you are planning on applying for this current round or any future potential uh, grant opportunities uh, as it re relates to ethics application. So please stay tuned for our next webinar series. And thank you again for completing the survey. Uh, have a lovely afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.